So we are here with our dear friend and the revered scholar and lovely person, Thupten Jimpa. Um, I, I don't even think, I know for most of you, you need, he needs no introduction. However, I'm gonna offer a, a small one. Um, he is, uh, among the many things that he has done, he, is, um, he has a degree in religious studies from Cambridge University. He has his Geshe Laram degree, he's a former monk, uh, renowned Tibetan Buddhist scholar, professor at McGill University. And he is, he, and obviously the translator, principal English translator for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He, and he's established the Institute of Tibetan Classics, which is designed to preserve Tibet's rich intellectual, spiritual and artistic heritage through the translation of many of its seminal texts. And this is a big undertaking and we are so grateful for him for doing this. And he's also, uh, a board member of Mind and Life Institute, the founder and chairman of the Compassion Institute, and a visiting research scholar at Stanford Institute for Neuro Innovation and Translational Neurosciences. And I, I think that just scratches the surface and there's more to know. <laughs> but, um, you know, the talk today is on Sankhapa, the mystical uh, dimensions of Sankhapa, because Issa had a little bit of a, say, a, a request <laughs> in there, so we'll see what, where we go. Um, and, you know, Issa and I uh, were having breakfast this morning, and she, she made this comment, and I think I'm going to share it with you. She said, you know, Jason Kappa was this, you know, he, he contributed so much to Tibetan Buddhist thought and the Gandan Renaissance and the evolution of Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhism. And he said, you know, Jimpa's doing that too. <laughs> With all of the work, they have a cut, there's a parallel here. So I'm gonna just put that out there, Jimpa, as I turn this over to you and welcome you and thank you so much for your presence. Thank you, Laura. Um, so when Laura was uh, reading the list of things that I do, it reminded me of a Tibetan saying, uh, Tibetan, uh, Tibetans tend to be a little, um, skeptical of people who are who, who seems to be doing a lot of stuff uh, at the same time and the, and the expression is trying to catch a bird also trying to catch a fish <laughs> at the same time because when you are trying to catch a bird you have to raise up reach up but if you're trying to catch a fish you have to reach down so so it's actually uh, not seen as a, a flattering description of someone <laughs> anyway, um well thank you um uh, uh, very kind introduction and thank you Isa for uh, the two of you for introduce, uh, inviting me and um, welcome all and uh, thank you for choosing to spend this you know early part of afternoon or morning for some of you um, with me you know discussing um, something that is of you know great interest to me personally and also hopefully to many of you. And uh, Sacred Stream, uh, you know, uh, Isa and Laura's uh, community is very dear to me uh, in many ways. Uh, they have been, you know, on a personal level, really close friends for a long, long time. And also uh, in my own work, especially with regard to the small work that I do to support my own monastery where I came from, Ganden, and especially the household within the Ganden um, uh, Dokang House, uh, Isa and Laura have been really, really kind and instrumental in making a lot of, uh, you know, things happen uh, possible there, including inviting a group of monks for an extended period of time on a tour in North America as, as a way of generating funds, at the same time offering something in return to the community. Talking about which I noticed there are two members from the monastery here joining by Zoom. It must be middle of night over there. So uh, I would like to thank you all for taking this time. Um, and uh, when Isa approached me for uh, this particular talk, um, and in fact, I was going to do that two years ago, um, I wanted to touch upon a certain aspect of Tsongkhapa, a specific aspect of Tsongkhapa, which is more mystical, you know, dimension, which don't really get much attention, um, particularly in the West, uh, in, in the contemporary literature. 
partly because his identity as a great scholar, a great thinker, a great philosopher, a reformer is so dominant. And many of his major texts have been translated into English. So whether it's an academic community or a Western Buddhist world or, you know, um, kind of contemporary thinkers who are interested in engaging with Tsongkhapa's thought, not as a Buddhist, but in a global kind of, you know, host of ideas kind of approach. Um, the engagement with Tsongkhapa tends to be very dominated from those angles. And so much so that very little space is left to these other aspects, uh, which was very, very important for him. So, and I tried to bring that out in my uh, biography, the modern biography that I wrote. Um, but one of the things that fascinates me about that particular aspect of Tsongkhapa's life, uh, and by the way, it isn't that unusual for a historical Tibetan master, that dimension of life would be found in the lives of many great masters. But what was interesting to me is, you know, we know from Tsongkhapa's writings that he was a great philosopher. He was probably one of the few in the history of religious thought in general, philosophy in particular, and, and more specifically Tibetan tradition, where he genuinely believed in the human thought and reason's potential for liberation. I mean, ultimately, as a Buddhist, um, um, he, he does agree that the highest state of ex en enlightenment uh, is beyond thought, beyond language, beyond dichotomy. It's a state beyond duality. But he took, for one, took it very seriously that just because the ultimate state is beyond thought and beyond language doesn't mean we dumped language and thought on the path. And, uh, and, and here, um, there's a, a, a beautiful passage in one of the later Tibetan writers who, who compare um, the, the human language and thought to the aid that is provided by a walking stick for an elderly man, you know? So uh, an elderly man is able to get around by relying on the help of a walking stick. So this master also says that the language and thought are like that. You know, it's, you don't, you, you should not get, we should not get fixated on the language and thought itself, but the language and thought are means by which we will be able to get to where we want to go. So this, this is one area where Tsongkhapa has really has driven very deeply to really kind of push the limits to which human thoughts and language, particularly thought, can be refined. And he makes a distinction between disciplined application of thought and kind of, you know, a, a, a random thought that tend to arise in the form of rumination. That in a, and, and, and the Indian Buddhist epistemology reminds us the function of thought is just the internal chatter. <laughs> it's the thought, we don't have to will thought. Thoughts just will come. And, and that's the nature of thought. They, when thought arises, they have a free flowing, you know, kind of, you know, energy of its own. That's one of the reasons why someone like Salman Rushdie's writing is very powerful because Salman Rushdie doesn't write in this clean, linear, structured way, which many writers write. Human, you know, Rushdie's power of telling the story comes from the fact that he's able to capture the messiness of the, of the, of the style of human thinking. I mean, that's at least how I see it. Yeah. So what Tsongkhapa is suggesting is that there is a fundamental distinction between a disciplined application of thought versus, you know, just ruminations that pop up. Uh, and, you know, and, and which are generally driven by habitual patterns. Um, and then that, and, and furthermore, now modern uh, psychology shows us that actually many of the ruminating nature of thoughts tend to be about ourselves. It's a self-oriented thought. <laughs> it's about, and, and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition teaches us that, you know, our thoughts generally tend to be about anticipation of what's going to come. 
you know, driven by hopes and fears and expectations or something looking backwards into the past, you know, in some form of resentment, regret, whatever, rejoicing. So very rarely do we actually stay in the present. And that's, that's one of the reasons why modern mindfulness is turning out to be very powerful and efficacious technique for the contemporary secular world because it teaches the technique to somehow refrain from this tendency to either you know, move back in the past or project in the future and learn some skills to stay in the present. So we know, you know, and, and then also the, the, the contemporary science shows us that a large part of this free flowing rumination, ruminatory kind of thoughts is really about me. It, it's very self-focused. And in fact, the brain regions of self-orientation and rumination actually overlaps. <laughs> so that's, a, and, and uh, so there's, there's a reason for that. But what I want to get at is that Tsongkhapa genuinely believed in the power of you know, disciplining human thought and then finding a way to apply it. Now that does presuppose some basic skills to quieten your mind and rest, settle it so that it doesn't get immediately taken over and which also requires a basic attentional training because attention in a natural normal state, attention arises because there is a new information that we are experiencing. There's a novelty. That's one of the reasons why you know, modern films and entertainment, they are so fast moving because they need to present new information <laughs> quickly so that you don't get bored, you know? Or attention is triggered by something that is fearful. So we know when we are afraid, we have a very acute attentional ability. But what the contemplative practice is teaching us is the ability to cultivate attention so that we can sustain our attention in a deliberate way. So the disciplined application of the thought does require some of these basic skills so that you do, we do need to, I, I don't think there is an avoiding of doing some basic quiet sitting practice <laughs> if we are serious about being able to get some handle on our, mind, on our mind. But having said that, you know, then we do find this very mystical aspects of Tsongkhapa's life where he's experiencing these visions of Manjushri to the point where his relationship, if we are to believe the biographies uh, written around, you know, by some of his students, you know, his immediate students, um, as well as some of his contemporaries uh, talk about him having almost a kind of an ongoing day-to-day -day kind of a tutor-pupil relationship with this, you know, ex extra human figure, uh, Manjushri. And, and Tsongkhapa's own writings uh, also explicitly speak about the experience, you know, when he's writing to his te tutor teacher or when he's writing to some of his close uh, colleagues. So there is, he also acknowledges, and in many of his writings, uh, in the salutation, he refers specifically to Manjushri when he pays homage, uh, Guru Manjushri. Um, so, you know, using the epithet Guru, a teacher. So clearly um, it was a reality in his life. Now, of course, from a purely secular perspective, what exactly is the nature of that reality? What exactly is that phenomenon? Is very difficult to articulate. But the fact is, it was a felt reality in his life. That is a fact which he himself acknowledges as well as his contemporary uh, scholars and biographers. So then the question is, if he as a philosopher, you know, who believes in the ability of human thought to reason, uh, apply the, you know, and then he takes very seriously uh, Nagarjuna and Chantakriti, uh, you know, sort of approach um, where, you know, he believes that human thought has the potential to be able to take us to the revelation of the truth in the ultimate nature of reality. The truth may not, the thought may not fully capture or represent what that ultimate nature is, but it can take us 
you know, take us there. So if that is the case, then how does he himself view and use the authority of this teacher, this guru, this mystical presence in his life? Interestingly, Tsongkhapa almost never actually cites the authority of Manjushri as a way of making a point, as a way of substantiating a position that he's holding. That's very interesting. So in that sense, he's not using this experience that he has and whatever revelations that he's experiencing as a way of um, stating the truth as it were. So, so in that case, the relationship uh, with that authority voice seems to be quite different from a typical relationship we will find in a big general religious tradition where scripture is accorded such an authority because it's a revelation. So it doesn't, but on the other hand, he does take it very seriously. And if you look at where, at what points in his development, spiritual development or you know, personal practice development, uh, there is a kind of a, a direct interaction with this mysterious presence. Um, now we know from the biography that when he first got introduced, it was through a medium uh, by the name of Umapa. And Tsongkhapa was in his late twenties um, and it was a medium and the medium approached Tsongkhapa's own students uh, to seek meeting with Tsongkhapa saying that he himself had a revelation and instructing him to meet with this, meet, meet with Tsongkhapa. So the in, at the initial stage, the communication was really through this medium. So one could imagine it probably what is happening here. Now, this is my guess uh, is that, you know, once in a while when they're uh, uh, in a session, probably the medium is going into some kind of trance. And then in that trance state, uh, communication is taking place. Um, but in any case, the initial stage of that relationship was primarily through the medium of Umapa. And then uh, a high point of that was um, Tsongkhapa uh, spent some time in Lhasa with the mystic, just before the mystic returned to his uh, home in, in Eastern Tibet. So they, uh, they, they, chose to spend some time together. They stayed in the same place, two separate meditation rooms, but they shared their meal, uh, breakfast and lunch. And as observant monastics, they did not eat supper. So, and, in, and the biography tells us that it was during some of these tea sessions when they were having that they would be spontaneous, you know, communication. And uh, so it seems, but in, in those early stages, um, it was really Tsongkhapa asking uh, many, you know, questions on many important points that he's kind of, you know, contemplating or struggling, whether it has to do with, you know, and, the, and some of the key aspects are really to do with the Nagarjuna's uh, philosophy of emptiness. Um, and Tsongkhapa really uh, wanted to get to the bottom of it because on the surface, um, you know, Nagarjuna's teaching can be read as nihilistic. Um, you know, everything is empty. Uh, there is nothing. Uh, there is nothing that has objective reality. And then, how do you square that with, um, you know, emphasis on observance of, you know, moral codes? How do you distinguish between right and wrong? If you don't have, you know, no fact of the world grounds the moral laws. Uh, similarly, how do you? ground um, the facts of the world that seems to be regulated and has cause and effect causal relationship and law of the causality uh, obeys. You know, when you touch fire, it burns. When you drink water, it quenches your thirst. So how do you actually account for that kind of regularity that we preserve and also we intersubjectively? It's not just someone, a single person's viewpoint. You know, just as I experience the world in a particular way, Broadly, many fellow human beings experience in the same way, given the, the biological constitution of our body. And particularly on the emotion domain, Buddhism is very universalist. Buddhism believes there are certain fundamental human 
you know, basic emotions, you know, kind of common to all sentient beings, living beings that are, have the capacity to experience pain and pleasure. And then furthermore, higher levels of emotions will be universal to humans, uh, you know, given our social uh, reality and all of this. Um, so Tsongkhapa really wants to have an integrated way of seeing the world where you don't compartmentalize. This is what has happened sometimes historically in the Buddhist world. You, when it comes to ultimate nature of reality, you go with Nagarjuna. And when, you come, when it comes to meditation practices, you go with Yogacara. And when it comes to epistemological thinking, you go with Dharmakirti and Dignag. Uh, when it comes to talking about the physical world, you go with Abhidharma, you know, psychology, Abhidharma. So, and, and that's actually in some ways it's, it's, it's okay. Um, and it's also, it's quite a simple approach because you sort of compartmentalize. And, but Tsongkhapa was a real philosopher, you know, yes, some of these sources have their strengths in particular domain, but as a human being, who's living this life as an integrated person, you know, the world is not divided in those terms, you know, you know, our thought requires that kind of division to make sense of the reality, but the reality is just one. So how do you reflect that in the way in which you understand the world in an integrated way? And this is what makes Tsongkhapa very impressive because his quest is very thorough, very methodical, very patient, never rushing to jump to conclusion. And whenever he had doubts, he stayed with the doubts. So the, in the early stages, um, you know, the Manjushri's role seemed to be almost like a kind of a sounding board for Tsongkhapa's kind of, you know, going through these processes. Um, but there's one actually, um, you know, uh, uh, quite a moving scene where um, the day before Lama Umapa leaves uh, central Tibet, you know, they set up an altar on top of the Lhasa Cathedral in a southeastern section under the roof. Um, they set up an altar. Tsongkhapa gives Lama Umapa a, a specific teaching and the Lama Umapa, you know, then serving as a medium gives the final teaching uh, to Tsongkhapa as, as the medium. Um, that's a beautiful scene. Once Lama Umapa leaves, then Tsongkhapa begins to have his own personal kind of, you know, intimations of a, of a communication. And, um, and one of the things that Lama Umapa did was uh, through the medium saying that he needed to go on a long-term retreat, intensive retreat. So as soon after Lama Umapa leaves, uh, Tsongkhapa leaves everything and goes to an intensive retreat, which lasts about three years joined only by eight very select, uh, you know, uh, hermits. Um, so those are, you know, written in my biography, but there's one, um, so it seems after a while, after Lama Umapa was gone, uh, I don't know how exactly was the communication taking place, uh, whether it is in the form of a sound that he's hearing, but there is, a communication, um, but then at some point, you know, um, during the retreat, intensive retreat, he does experience few visions, but the, the most important visions actually come after the three-year retreat was over. Uh, after the three-year retreat is over, he still hasn't fully resolved his qualms with the philosopher emptiness, um, you know, and, and it's not so much what exactly is emptiness, but fleshing out the implications of what, what this truth really means. You know, what does it mean to embrace Nagarjuna's truth of emptiness as reflecting the nature of reality? What does it mean in the area of this X, Y, and Z? So um, he comes out of retreat, spends some time, and then takes another year off on an intensive retreat, this time on his own. And th at that time, there is a very important vision that he experiences. And in the vision itself, there's no real teaching, but the vision is quite uh, uh, prophetic, 
for example, the vision is about uh, Nagarjuna surrounded by five of his main disciples or interpreters. And then in the dream, an Indian pundit, um, you know, sort of walks down and places a text on Tsongkhapa's head. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and in the dream itself, Tsongkhapa re- uh, comes to understand this is Buddha Palita, who was a great commenta- early commentator on Nagarjuna, a fifth century uh, master. And the next morning, in Tsongkhapa wakes up, you know, with a tremendous sense of bliss and, and kind of almost a kind of ecstatic joy. And uh, this dream has completely kind of shifted something in him. And then um, he happens to receive a gift from someone, a monk, Buddha Palista's text. And then he sees immediately, makes the connection as an auspicious symbol and then sits down and reads through the text. And as he's reading and contemplating, then there is, as the, as the biography says, there was almost like a spontaneous bolt of lightning type experience. And that's when everything became clear. So it looks like, you know, for those of us uh, who like to follow Tsongkhapa's example and who likes to believe that at least we can use our human thought (laughs) on the way as we are moving. It looks like a lot of the hard work is really done at the level of thought, thinking, deeper contemplation. When the actual experience occurs, I think there is a kind of a jump. There is a kind of a spontaneity. So so that was an important, uh, but again here, you know, for for a naive reader, one would expect that if he's having visions of someone like Manjushri, why can't he get all the answers in one go? <laughs> I don't think it works like this. I think, and, and this is probably, you know, reflects uh, the fundamental truth of what the Buddha was saying, that you are your own master. Somehow our own enlightenment is something that we have to work it out ourselves. And there's a beautiful passage where uh, it says that uh, Buddha does not, you know, remove the pains of others. Or Buddha cannot wash away the sins of others, you know, nor can he transplant his own realization into the heart of someone. It's only by showing the truth that he has seen that he can help others gain liberation. I think that, I think, seems to be quite true, particularly reflecting in Tsongkhapa's, you know, biography, where although he has access to someone like Manjushri, who for the Tibetan Buddhist is the Buddha of wisdom. So he's supposed to be the embodiment of the wisdom of all the Buddhas, but even there, Buddha of wisdom does not seem to have the power to just give a kind of a prescription to Tsongkhapa and say, just, <laughs> just swallow this. <laughs> so it looks like this self-work that we have to do seems to be un- unavoidable. Another key point in Tsongkhapa's kind of, you know, uh, mystical kind of uh, experience with Tsongkhapa, uh, Manjushri comes, um, he, after this particular retreat, he goes back for another two years, traveling, teaching. He led a very uh, um, wandering life, actually, until he established Gandhin in 1409. He never stayed in one monastery. He never actually identified with one monastery as his residence. So in some some ways, uh, his lifestyle was very similar to the historical Buddha. You know, Buddha was always moving around. If you look at the biography of the Buddha in the sutras, you know, and especially choosing to stay longest period was during the rainy season retreat. There's a three month retreat that he has to observe. Uh, you know, like all the monastic community members, but he never chose one as a permanent resident. So Tsongkhapa seems to have done the same thing until Gandhin was set up. Because And Gandhin was set up partly because his followers were complaining. They were saying it's just too stressful to be constantly moving around. And towards the end, before Gandhin was set up, when he was moving around, there were like five to 700 monastics following him and, and imagine the pressure it puts on the local community to be able to feed them. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> no wonder many of his supporters were the ruling elite members, you know, of the Tibetan central Tibetan sort of, you know, uh, government in central Tibet. But the, then eventually many of the senior disciples, particularly Gelsab and uh, Dulzin said, this is just too much, you know, and you're getting older and this is just too much and too taxing and just the logistics of arranging for the hundreds of monks who come for their you know, place to sleep and food is just too much. So finally he said, okay, okay, okay. So then he agreed to have Gandhi set up. But until that time, he was constantly moving around. So then he comes back to the Walker Valley region, which is his favorite retreat place once more. Um, and it was during that third retreat, uh, which was nearly a year, one of the high points of that, uh, that, that in a meditation period there was uh, this grand vision. So this vision is a very grand one. Um, and it's captured in, in the you know, biographical hymns to Tsongkhapa. And in this, basically, uh, what he experienced was, and sometimes this is depicted in Tsongkhapa's life tankers. And uh, there's a Manjushri in a rainbow kind of halo um, and from Manjushri's heart is a, a sword made of light extending from his heart. And then the tip reaches Tsongkhapa's heart. And on, the, through the, on that sword, nectars flow um, and light and nectars flow from Manjushri to Tsongkhapa. And, and this was apparently a, quite a powerful experience that some of the immediate disciples uh, attendants around Tsongkhapa also felt that something was happening. Um, so this was an, an, an important part of that was, I think this was the turning point in Tsongkhapa's Vajrayana experience, particularly the experience of great bliss. And one of the central aims in the Vajrayana practice is cultivating subtle states of consciousness whose tone is bliss, um, and then applying it to meditation on emptiness. And this is referred to as the union of bliss and emptiness. And, and the idea here is that in a non-Vajrayana practice, the mind that is used, the subject that is used for understanding the truth is really at the level of thought. It's a more grosser level of consciousness. And the grosser levels of consciousness are very heavily defined by dualistic approach, dualistic perspective. So what needs to happen is to, and this is one area where Vajrayana uses many of the yogic techniques. And the underlying this is the understanding that the, the thought or mind, the movement of mind is very closely connected with the movement of energy in the body. And by kind of uh, using yogic techniques to really kind of, you know, uh, slow down the energy uh, movement in the body and uh, getting to the point where it comes to a very subtle level will allow the mind to naturally reach to a subtle level. And the progressively subtle levels of consciousness become more and more independent from the typical things that tend to overlay the human mind, concepts, thoughts, uh, visual images, um, and, and many of these. So, and, and the aim in Vajrayana is to really cultivate one's practice to a point where one is able to invoke these subtle levels of consciousness and then fuse it with understanding of emptiness. And then when that happens at a very deep level, then uh, one experiences great bliss. So this particular experience Tsongkhapa has with the Manjushri sword really has this powerful connotation with the surge of bliss uh, in, his, in his experience. Now, the one important point is that despite all of this, and this is where Tsongkhapa is very remarkable, even though he acknowledges these experiences in his writing, he never uses the, the, his experience of visions of Manjushri as an authority 
to prove a point. That I think is a very important point to rem remember because there is also uh, underlying this is also an understanding that when it comes to the actual truth, the fundamental nature of reality, it is universal. We cannot say I have my version of truth and you have your version of truth. <laughs> but when it comes to the actual mystical experiences like vision of Manjushri, vision of Tara or uh, Avalokiteshvara, there is a lot of individuation. I think there is a lot of specificity. And that probably is partly due to the differences that make us individuals. So the Tibetans would, you know, account it in terms of our karmic propensities, um, you know, our body constitutions, particularly the 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 you know vayu the the winds and the energy constitutions and also kind of you know uh, past relationship history with the certain practices so how the how the visions are experienced seems to have a lot of specificity and diversity and therefore citing his vision as a way of demonstrating an authority on a particular doctrinal or philosophical point, even if it is to do with Vajrayana practice, is something that Tsongkhapa really avoids. Uh, so that's what makes um, Tsongkhapa's writing pretty impressive because he's basically presenting his writings in a way where the text, what he has written will stand by themselves without invoking this extra human authority that he's so famous to have experienced. Uh, so those are what makes, um, for me at least, because um, you know, um, in my own personal practice, um, as much as possible, I like to follow Tsongkhapa's example. And I do believe in the, the sort of uh, liberating power of human thought, uh, the potential for you know, having, cultivating a disciplined mind and also learning to apply one's mind in a disciplined manner, uh, which, to be honest, if you look at the more advanced form of meditation practices, they tend to presuppose that you have some ability to <laughs> direct your mind <laughs> so that you are not at the mercy of your own habitual thought patterns, which is what a lot of people, you know, a lot of us are in our normal uh, situation. So uh, those are something that I've been kind of... Um, you know, intrigued at the beginning because I kept, you know, when I was thinking about his biography, you know, I thought, oh, I'm going to solve this problem about, you know, how does this mystical dimension fit into this, <laughs> you know, clean narrative of him as a great thinker. And, um, you know, having had the chance to work on the biography, um, you know, I don't think I have found all the answers, but at least I have found a way to deepen my uh, appreciation of that particular aspect of Tsongkhapa's life. And also his own very responsible, careful uh, use of that particular aspect of his life so that he's not abusing um, the authority of that personal experience as someone being, I'm a great mystic, you know, now I hold the truth. Here are the X, Y, and Z kind of thing you know he did not do that he basically wrote down um, even on vajrayana practices um, whatever he himself has cultivated and his own doubts and also the you know when it comes to um, you know expounding nagarjuna's philosophy of emptiness you know he does it in a very methodical way uh, almost as if guiding us through a very uh, sort of, you know, uh, refined, you know, increasingly refined process of, you know, philosophical reflection, uh, contemplative, you know, some of which are contemplative. If you look at way in which Tsongkhapa takes up, for example, one of the things that he's most famous for is this idea of identifying the object of negation. So we all know when we talk about emptiness, emptiness is a negation, it's a non-existence. Then the question is non-existence or what? So the large part of his philosophical reflection is fleshing out what is that what? Um, so, and, and, and he does it in a way 
that constantly involve inviting us to reflect our own natural human innate experience of the way in which we see the world. For example, like um, he says that uh, when you are negating uh, in the context of emptiness, um, you should not think as if you are negating something externous to the things that we perceive and experience on a daily basis. Uh, it is not negating something external, but it is negating the you know our assumption of how things exist. So it's it's not so much negating what, it's more like negating in what sense. So those are really you know profound understanding, and also with respect to teaching on emptiness, you know, unlike other masters, Tsongkhapa ties up the teaching on emptiness very strongly to human psychology of how grasping um, you know, is so powerful and how grasping arises underpinned by our false assumption. And on top of that, our attribution of you know, properties or qualities onto things beyond you know, what the thing themselves you know, really could afford. Uh, so, I mean, there are deep psychology also in his thinking. So that's what makes his writings so powerful. And also uh, for us devout Buddhists, uh, you know, even though Tsongkhapa does not want us to approach it that way, but for us devout Buddhists, for at least for myself, the fact that he had a tutor in the form of Manju Guru Manjushri that he was able to verify now and then, and at least have a confirmation um, in the form of this relationship is also a deeply, deeply uh, comforting as, as well as a source of conviction and, and faith and devotion. So, so I wanted to share some of these with you and uh, thank you, Isa and uh, Laura for giving me the opportunity because this is not the kind of talk that I normally give. <laughs> so uh, it's wonderful to be able to think aloud, um, um, you know, in, in this way. Thank you.